lights. And yeah. then they put that All in. right, it's my pleasure to introduce the final panel of the conference or workshop today. Um, my name is Gretchen Hefner. I'm an assistant professor at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, and this um, roundtable is Wars at Home. Um, and I'm, as I said, particularly interested in being here for this um, because we're going to hear more about pe how people experienced and participated in the war um, as individuals um, and as groups. Um, and I'll follow sort of precedent and introduce each speaker right before they speak. Um, and they've been given strict orders that 15 minutes is the absolute max. <laughs> um, and I guess we'll run a little bit over because we're starting a little bit late. So bear with us here. Um, the good and bad news is it's, it is the last panel, so um, that should work for everyone. Uh, so first is Julia Irwin, who is a, an assistant professor um, at the University of South Florida. Uh, and I actually um, met Julia, was that four years ago? So. Um, <laughs> I'd heard a lot about Julia. We were both um, PhD students at Yale, and I'd never run into her. Our lives sort of never uh, intersected until, bizarrely, we were seated at graduation about four years ago, and she was sitting right next to me. Um, and I was like, oh, I've heard about you, and I've heard about your work. Um, and it was at graduation, Julia's dissertation won um, a prestigious uh, award um, at Yale, the Small Pro Edwin Small Prize, is that what it is? Um, as well as a Schaefer dissertation award, and that dissertation um, was published as a book last fall, um, and that is called Making the World Safe, the, Red Cro the American Red Cross and the Nation's Humanitar Human Humanitarian Awakening, um, which was from last fall, um, which I think she's going to speak a little bit about today, which traces the Red Cross and humanitarian efforts um, uh, during World War I and the World War I era. Uh, her next project, which I, which I just want to mention, which I think um, is equally as interesting, at least uh, the title is fabulous, Catastrophic Diplomacy, A History of U.S. Responses to Global Natural Disasters, um, which she has started working on. Um, so we probably won't talk about much today, but ask her questions about it later. So, Julia. All right. Thank you very much for the, the nice introduction, Gretchen, and thanks to all of you for a great conference so far. Um, as, as Gretchen mentioned, I will be talking about humanitarianism and U.S. foreign relations during World War I. Um, and I, I have a title, uh, as I was supposed to. Uh, my title is Taming Total War, Great War Era Humanitarianism and Its Legacies. Um, the First World War and its aftermath are often remembered, and rightfully so, uh, as a period defined by violence, brutality, and inhumanity, an era that witnessed unprecedented suffering among soldiers and civilians alike. Yet at the same time, the years from 1914 through the early 1920s also gave rise to a seemingly more constructive historical legacy, the development and application of new approaches to wartime humanitarian relief. In an attempt to curb the conflict's staggering human toll, the governments and peoples of both belligerent and neutral nations took novel and concerted steps to aid the battlefield wounded and to care for those behind the lines. As total war raged, people throughout the world endeavored to minimize its calamitous social effects. In 2014, a century after the Great War commenced, these humanitarian legacies are well worth remembering, but also worth contemplating. By seeing the First World War era as not only a period of great suffering, but also as a time in which millions of people joined an international movement to alleviate that suffering, we historians of international relations stand to recover a profound history of transnational humanity and compassion. Simultaneously, though, it's, it's essential that we analyze these, these humanitarian efforts with a critical eye, and we eschew the simple equation that if war is bad, humanitarianism must somehow represent an absolute good. While altruistic intentions surely motivated many donors and relief workers, and while many soldiers and non-combatants certainly benefited from the provision of food, shelter, clothing, and medical care, a closer analysis of humanitarian relief reveals that it was never a purely beneficent undertaking. The ostensible goal of humanitarian aid may have been the betterment of international welfare, but it could, and did, serve other agendas. It functioned variously as a form of propaganda, a means of social control, and a tool of statecraft and nation building. Rather than acting as an antithesis to conflict, moreover, humanitarian aid arguably helped to validate war by softening its horrors. Even as we commemorate the impulse to treat wounded soldiers and to reduce the suffering of European civilians then, 
we must also come to terms with the less savory legacies of great war era humanitarianism. In my brief remarks today, I intend to do just this, uh, to offer a set of reflections on the history and mixed legacies of great war era humanitarianism. Uh, first, though, a note on scope is in order. In my talk today, uh, and in the longer essay from which it draws, uh, I restrict my attention to aid that was organized and administered by American citizens and relief agencies. There are two good reasons, I argue, for limiting the discussion in this way. Uh, first of all, a study of American aid activities underscores the relevance of humanitarianism to U.S. international history, uh, the principal focus for most of us gathered here today. Second, U.S. aid efforts uh, merit special attention because of the unparalleled and unprecedented role that Americans and their institutions played in the relief effort. During the war and its aftermath, the American Red Cross, the Commission for Relief in Belgium, Near East Relief, the American Relief Administration, and scores of other U.S. voluntary and religious organizations raised and distributed billions of dollars worth of food, medical supplies, clothing, and other aid for Europe. This aid assisted millions of people, including both American and European soldiers, and civilian men, women, and children from all parts of Europe and the Near East. This humanitarian undertaking had major implications for Europe and for the United States, both at the time and in the century that followed. American relief, then, played a particularly significant role in the Great War era. Analyzing its history provides several new perspectives on the history of both U.S. foreign affairs and international humanitarianism. <laughs> for one, it encourages a reperiodization of U.S. involvement in the war. We've talked about reperiodization before, but I have my own reperiodization here. Uh, seen, seen through the lens of humanitarianism, U.S. participation in World War I entailed more than a three-year window of U.S. military intervention and post-war peace negotiations. It began in September 1914, when the American Red Cross first sent relief ships to Europe. It ended not with the Senate's rejection of the Treaty of Versailles in 1920, but instead when the last American Relief Administration workers departed Europe in 1923. By broadening the definition of intervention beyond the traditional spheres of militarism and diplomacy, the history of American humanitarianism extends the period of active U.S. participation in the Great War to nearly a decade. Studying American humanitarianism also offers alternative ways of thinking about U.S.-European relations during this era. For one, it brings novel actors into the history of the U.S. in the First World War. Tens of thousands of American women and men spent time in Europe as relief workers, many serving in areas where U.S. troops never deployed. The American Red Cross, for instance, uh, had, had organizations in 25 nations uh, in the war and its aftermath, uh, places including Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Siberia, and the Near East. Uh, in the United States, millions uh, of other American adults and children supported these efforts by volunteering time and donating money to humanitarian organizations. These individuals played an important part in the American war effort and warrant inclusion in its history more than they have been given. Exploring the activities of American humanitarians, moreover, demonstrates a very personal side of the history of U.S.-European relations. American relief workers forged tangible connections with millions of European soldiers and civilians. These humanitarians touched, soothed, fed, bathed, and bandaged European men, women, and children. They surveyed refugee housing, they inspected relief applicants, and they instructed aid recipients to adopt different hygienic or sanitary behaviors. Together, these humanitarian activities call attention to a very intimate side of international exchange. Finally, examining American humanitarianism in Great Warrior Europe is crucial in, or in order to recognize the profound and lasting legacies that it left, the defining theme of today's conference. One such legacy is that during the First World War era, the U.S. federal government greatly expanded its reach into the field of foreign relief, sparking a trend that would escalate dramatically in coming decades. Private citizens and aid organizations funded and administered most relief efforts during World War I. Yet, as U.S. diplomatic and military officials came to recognize the strategic value of that aid, they facilitated these voluntary efforts in myriad ways. In addition, the U.S. government, through its Army Medical Relief Department, and through the post-war uh, American Relief Administration, expanded its own humanitarian role enormously. This increasing state involvement in the relief field pre uh, prefigured the U.S. government's later embrace of aid and development 
as tools of Cold War era statecraft. American humanitarianism in the Great War era thus represents a crucial early chapter in the history of US foreign assistance, a prelude to the humanitarianism of the American century. A second legacy of Great War era humanitarianism can be found in its implications for civilians in wartime. It's not until 1949 that the Fourth Geneva Conventions formally established provisions for the protection of civilian persons in times of war. More than three decades earlier, however, American relief workers took part in a crusade to safeguard the health and welfare of European noncombatants. From the beginning of war in 1914, and for several years after the 1918 armistice, American humanitarians provided food, shelter, clothing, and medical care to refugees and other civilians across Europe and the Near East. These early 20th century attempts to protect civilians invite a reconceptualization of the Great War era and its consequences. Even as it generated unprecedented human suffering, the conflict simultaneously gave rise to new humanitarian sensibilities. A third and final legacy uh, concerns the ethical questions that the history of Great War era humanitarian, humanitarianism raises. The relief activities that Americans organized from 1914 to 1923 were never purely altruistic, neutral, or apolitical, nor could they be. Foreign aid may have helped to mitigate suffering, but it simultaneously served diplomatic and military agendas. Although many welcomed and benefited from US assistance, others found legitimate reasons for objecting to it, recognizing its potential coercive and political aspects. Humanitarianism, in short, was com complicated and contested terrain in the First World War era, something that we need to remember. <coughs> uh, a century later, it continues to be. Rather than blithely celebrating its virtues, it's essential for, for scholars to interrogate these critiques, the hypocrisies, the paradoxes, and the power struggles that lie at the heart of the history of foreign assistance. Even when we do, we are left with unresolved moral dilemmas. For instance, while most of us would probably agree that reducing human distress is a positive good, uh, how do we reconcile this belief with the notion that humanitarianism might actually make war more palatable by mitigating its atrocities? We must also acknowledge that the emergence and development of modern humanitarianism coincided with surging nationalism, brutal imperialism, and the mechanization of modern warfare, and that these historical trends were, in fact, intimately related. Raising these points is not meant to dismiss the idealism inherent in the quest to make the world a more humane place, nor to deride the noble intentions and tireless labors of many relief workers. It is simply to encourage a more balanced, more reflective, and more nuanced commemoration of great war era humanitarianism and its profound and enduring legacies. Thanks. Next, next, we have Michael Adas, um, who is the Abraham E. Voorhees Professor of History at Rutgers and also the Director of Global and Comparative History, um, the Global and, Global and Comparative History Master's Program at Rutgers. Um, I, uh, had the, I took the liberty of Googling you to find out something you know, unexpected that wasn't in your bio. <laughs> and it turns out he has a Wikipedia page, which I find like, kind of tremendous. I don't know. I aspire someday that someone creates a Wikipedia page for me. Hint. Um, but he has a Wikipedia page, which lists, I think, his uh, remarkable accomplishments and publications. Um, and I won't list them here, but I will refer you to that page <laughs> if you want to see them all. Um, but what I do want to emphasize is something that Michael, in fact, mentioned today himself, um, which is um, the sort of evolution that he's gone through as a historian from being what I think you described as an area studies specialist, right, in South Asia, Southeast Asia to someone who writes about global, technological, um, sort of imperial and anti-colonial histories uh, in really important ways. And I know some of um, the texts that many of us are familiar with, Dominance by Design um, and Machines as the Measure of Men, have been influential in my own work. I know many other people's as well. Um, and today, I, that is not the topic <laughs> of, his, of his talk. Um, instead, he's going, uh, in, in the current project is looking at, um, and I think you, you described it best to me, as a counterintuitive comparative study of um, military experiences, the American military experience in Vietnam and the British experience during World War I. 
Um, so you can see why that might seem sort of counterintuitive. Um, and he's not speaking on that today, but I wanted to mention it because I think it's really interesting. Um, he's talking today about uh, World War I in particular. Um, <laughs> But I always like to find out what people are up to. <laughs> See if he throws Vietnam and now you know why. Um, so without further ado, Michael. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that uh, <laughs> generous introduction. I, I, I do want to say a couple of, of uh, co or give you a couple of caveats before. Uh, the first thing is that, that uh, at the very end, we're actually coming to war, uh, and Julia took us close with uh, casualties and, and aid and those sorts of things. I'm not going to, I promise, I'm not going to fight the American battles in World War I, but I'm going to talk about the uh, American entry into the war and the conduct of the war. Uh, my, over, my title, this is not my title, this will not be my title for the paper. Uh, is the legacy of Ameri American military intervention in World War I, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And actually, the, that's the way I've structured, uh, I structured the article. Uh, I'm going, the only way I can do this is to sort of go quickly over, I'm going to give you the overall framework and stop in a few places to give you a sense of, of, of some, some things that are very uh, crucial to me. Uh, the other thing I should say, and especially because um, Matt and Eretz were, were so wonderful in, in terms of opening the war up. Is that's what I usually do, <laughs> but today I'm going to I'm going to close I'm going to close it in in my view. And for me, there's it's easy to justify this but as a comparativist. I'm obsessed with deep contextualization and case studies that that really really that that the experts won't pick apart. Okay, and so <laughs> I've worked very hard. Uh, on the, 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 uh, for another for another aspect of my work, I've worked very hard on the spent a lot of time on the American uh, American impact. Essentially, my argument is three is uh, the basic ar ar argument of the article will be three parts, uh, and each part is a different level or dimension of the American legacy, the American intervention, and the American legacy. The first part is on the rather immediate impact of the American entry into the end game of the war. And I'm not going to go into that too much, but I'm happy. Uh, I love to talk about it. So if you want to come back to it, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, um, to do that. Uh, and so basically, except for the naval side, which I'm going to mention in passing, but it's very, very important. Uh, I'm going to, in terms of the land warfare, we're talking ba basically about late summer 1917 to the uh, November 19, 1918. Uh, the second part, and I'm going to spend more time on this, um, are the lessons learned or ignored uh, and here I'm building on some really uh, wonderful military historians who have revised our whole vision of Pershing and the American involvement in the, in the war. And then I'm, the, I'm going to end with some of the longer term implications of the uh, uh, American intervention. And I want to get to those, so I may cut some other things short, but I'll warn you when I, uh, when I do. Each part, oh, the one, two things. One, I, 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 when I started the article, I thought, well, I'll take them each in turn. It became problematic because very often when I was talking about one, the larger implications of, uh, or the, the middle range implications were right there, and it didn't seem any, it didn't seem sensible to not deal with them where, where they actually uh, where they actually ap ap appeared. Uh, and each of the first two, the third one I'm just going to talk about, and I may frame it more. Each of the first two I frame. And so I'm going to t frame it, put it frame in the context because I think it's very important. And so I'm going to talk about that quickly and, and then uh, try to give you a sense of what, what I'm, from the American side, what I'm dealing with. And where we start is uh, 1917, which was a very bad year for the Allies. The Russians are knocked out of the war. Italy is basically uh, crippled. Uh, the French armies are on the verge of collapse and in mutiny. Uh, uh, Romania, is, uh, or Romania is literally annihilated uh, by the Germans, uh, and uh, in the midst of all of this, you have Hague once again. Uh, let's, uh, I have no use for Hague, but we could, uh, we probably don't want to discuss that. But anyway, he's battering away at the at the German lines and killing and uh, you know slaughtering, having young British soldiers uh, slaughtered in, uh, en masse. Uh, and then it's also the year of the Nivelle fiasco, uh, which causes uh, not just uh, Haig's leadership, but um, uh, Lloyd George's uh, to, be, uh, to, to be questioned. And my basic theme here is that the two, the two parts, first is that the British managed to pull, despite Haig, the British managed to pull themselves together enough so that 
after all of the disasters, the other disasters, um, they, they basically stand alone. So by the end of 1917, the, Germans, the German high command has basically decided if we can knock the British out, we can win the war. And I think this is a, I, like, I love counterfactuals. I think Matt did some counterfactuals. I love them because at that moment, the Germans still have, they can, they've won the war everywhere else virtually, and they can negotiate a stalemate. And how history would have changed if they negotiate from a, from a position of strength. Uh, but there, I think in basically this is, I, I, I don't believe in great man history, but I put a lot of weight on Ludendorff. Ludendorff becomes obsessed because of the great victories in the East, he becomes obsessed uh, with winning, uh, with winning it, it all. And the basically winning it all means knocking Britain out of the war, and it's precisely the gambles that he takes at this point are to knock Britain out of the war. The submarine war is to bring Britain to its knees, to starve Britain out before Germany starves out, because the high command is con increasingly concerned with the fact that Germany is going to uh, uh, do that. So the decision, and this is the, uh, Ritter, Gerhard Ritter, uh, has a uh, four volume, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, study of the intricacies of this and the quarrels and all the rest. But the bottom line for the Germans is, yes, this might bring the Americans into the war, but basically they argue that they can't come in fast enough. This, there's a whole series of things that I'm gonna talk about that deal with this. It goes all the way back to the Civil War where you had German and British and French observers who were not at all impressed with American generals or American soldiers. They thought they were a rabble. But in addition to that, the Germans are well aware that America basically doesn't have an army. It has a navy, and then we'll see that's very crucial, but it does not have an army. But, but the Germans don't count the navy. Uh, and so uh, the, I, I'm just summed that up. Um, Eduard von Kappel says to the German Reichstag, the American impact if they come into the war will, before we win will be zero. Mm -hmm. just, just like that. He's Rear, Rear, Rear Admiral Tirpitz acolyte. Uh, and uh, this, this, the, the high command is able to uh, sell that. So that both the sub-offensive, which ultimately fails, uh, and the 1918 offensives, again, there's another counterfactual, what if the Germans hadn't used them? They kept their best troops back. They had another million men. They could have gone, kept building the Hindenburg Line, and, and even after the Americans come in, sit there. What if they hadn't gone on the offensive? What would the uh, impact of that be? So that they, but, but they, but of course, uh, uh, Ludendorff, because he's basically calling the shots at this point, uh, Ludendorff uh, um, uh, gambles, uh, and, and, the sub, and the, in this, we talked about this to a certain extent, and I think it will come up in the other, other papers. Uh, ultimately, what Woodrow Wilson has done is he's over the, between the Lusitania uh, and the renewal of unrestricted submarine warfare in the spring of 19, eight, uh, 1917, uh, he's painted himself into a corner. He's basically told the world, I'm gonna go to war if you do this, and, uh, and so he's caught in a trap, uh, which I, again, that we could talk about whether he was, that's what he wanted or, or not. Uh, so that the, so uh, the long and the short of it is, is that uh, he, the Germans do go back to unrestricted warfare. America declares war, and America comes into the into into the uh, war. And there is an immediate legacy, and that immediate legacy is, in some ways, uh, I think it's neglected, but it's very very important. Is within weeks of the Americans coming into the war because America has a powerful fleet, and it, it doesn't have enough destroyers, but it's got a lot of destroyers, and it is it has the capacity, we'll see, one of the problems with Americans on land is that they don't have the weapons, but they have the capacity to build uh, particularly destroyers very, very quickly. But within weeks, uh, Admiral Sims of the American side, on the American side, and Jellicoe on the British side come together and create the convoy system, which uh, the le there's a lot of legacy here. The first legacy is it allows Britain to survive. It reduces the tonnage that sunk. The Germans have this all calculated. The Germans always calculate. They have this very, very detailed calculations. If we think 600,000 tons every month for six months, Britain will starve. Well, they start out over 600,000, and by August, September, they're down to around 100,000. So they've lost. The gambles, the gambles lost. It's not clear whether that would have worked or, or not. But the long and the short of it is that uh, that gamble fails, and it fails, I think, very, very significantly. It's one of the uh, major legacies. The British were debating the convoy system. Sims convinces them to adopt the convoy system, but he also, w with that comes uh, um, 
American destroyers, lots of American destroyers, and of course the destroyers and the, the sub-chasing boats, which America produces in the hundreds over the course of the war, uh, means first of all that the, the, the tonnage, the food and the things that America's been supplying, uh, supplying to Britain for uh, uh, years, uh, those now can those now can go unimpeded, impeded, but more importantly, the convoy system means that troops can uh, uh, cross the uh, cross the Atlantic with a reasonable degree of the sense that they're going to get there. Very very few, uh, in, I've read some places one none have, but I don't. I, I, it's not a credible statistic, but very very few American soldiers being transported across the Atlantic are die in submarine um, submarine attacks. The second thing, and I'm, again, I just want to mention this and go on. The second thing that's very important, and uh, the, I think the great description of it is in one of my favorite, absolute favorite books on the war, Vera Britton's um, uh, book on uh, the uh, testament of, testament of, 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 of war. Um, I think that's right. What's that? Youth. youth. Testament of youth. Sorry, I knew that sounded wrong. Mm -hmm. The Testament of youth, where and she and, and she's if, talk about someone who's ravaged by the war. I mean, she's lost all of the young males she's attached to her brother, her fiance, her best uh, male friend, um, and uh, and she talks about the arrival of the American troops, and it's just an incredible uh, passage where she talks about strong, and brave. And ready to fight and all these kinds of things. And the, the, so I think that the morale effect, and you also get this with Foch, he, the, in the early American battles, not the ones that come later, which are basically slaughters, uh, in the early American battles when they're, um, they're, when they're well led, uh, the, uh, the Americans perform, and also they're the best trained troops early on. Uh, the Mer Americans perform um, remarkably, uh, and Foch sees them as the, you know, he, he basically celebrates them after the Amel, which is a little battle, but the Americans did wonderful things because they were led well. I'll come back to that in a minute in another way. Um, uh, the, Foch sees them as the, the, the saviors. They, they've come to save us. We're going to be saved. So one of the things that does is revive the, the French. So basically, uh, we keep the British, in, in a sense, we make it possible for the British to stay in the war, uh, and we bolster the French. Uh, we can talk about this, and I'm happy to do it. But the the the, the question here is, um, did did we rest? Did did we win the war? Um, I would say no, decisively we did not. Okay, but that but that we had we we played we did not play a pip. I would say we did not play the pivotal role, but we were um, we were important in the in that final um, the final um, outcome. Uh, so the the uh, the. the other, the other, the other thing that, the other part of this then is the. I'm going to move from that. There, are, there are other things that we would deal with, but I want to deal with um, uh, uh, this, uh, this, these last things because the, a lot of the recent historiography has been on these, uh, and that is the, um, the, the whole, the whole question of, of, of the American conduct of the war and how that, how that, how that plays, uh, plays out. I think a couple things need to be said. The first is, and because I'm going to be kind of hard on Pershing, and one, that one of the one of the legacies of the war, I think, one of the legacies we've discovered is that um, uh, Pershing, we need to uh, reduce Pershing as this great hero, this great leader who led the Americans into battle uh, and won the war, right? Which is pretty much what he says in his report to the president, is that and he doesn't talk at all. He just makes reference to well, there were heavy losses. But he doesn't make reference to it. In the Musagon, it's a slaughter. It's a slaughter, and it was unnecessary. It was an unnecessary slaughter, and it was he, his whole strategic sense was wrong. But I, that's another. That's a, that's for another uh, another uh, day. Um, and and and, I, and just one other thing here, and I'll come back. As I said, come back to this another way. Uh, the in terms of the outcome of the war. I would argue that, as I said, the, the recovery of the, the French and the British, the British, even after a whole army is destroyed, the British ability to, to rebound from that is well, the other crucial factor, and this came up in a couple of places, are the, the again, widening the, our sense of the war, are the Dominion troops. Because I think in 1917 and in, 19, in the offenses of 1918, the Canadians and the Australians um, saved Britain. They kept, they kept Britain in the war, particularly in 1917, uh, despite, uh, again, uh, not their leaders, but the British leaders who, as at Gallipoli, uh, uh, get them slaughtered in, uh, in, large, uh, in large numbers. 
Okay, so the, the other thing that we have to say in terms of, when I get to the criticisms, because I'm going to um, basically list them, the, cur the criticisms of the conduct of war, many of which can be traced back to Pershing, and again, it's very important that Wilson gives him unlimited powers. It's, it's interesting, I can't get into this, why he picks Pershing, that's in the first place, but because I think that's more problematic than historians assume, they just assume, oh, he was a great, great general. Actually, he was a junior in general, and he was not. Um, he had good. He had great political ties, like Haig, um, but he, he's not as bad as Haig. But anyway, uh, I think the other thing that we have to put in place is that the Americans, Americans were, the Germans were right about this. And for a land war, the Americans were completely unprepared. And Pershing, Pershing is part of that because Pershing, he's he's the guy who takes us, the troops into Mexico, and he loses. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get Pancho Villa, right? But he's chasing him around, and that's exactly the way frontier war war works. It's wars of the, the United States cavalry. is first of all cavalry, which the Europeans, except for Haig, the Europeans know is dead in, in terms of war. Modern, modern uh, uh, mechanized war has destroyed that. Um, and, but the other part of it is that he, he has this concept, this very vague concept of open war. That somehow, and he has these, these notions that, that the rifle is the key weapon. It sounds like a French general before the, before the war. That the offensive is the thing and that the rifle is the weapon and will spread out and will rush, uh, will, uh, will rush the enemy. Uh, well, of course, that's, um, by this time, even Haig realizes that that's insanity. That, that's the, 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 that machine guns and artillery are the weapons that are going to win uh, or lose the uh, war. Okay, so that, but it's important to realize that, that uh, Pershing is faced with this Herculean task, uh, and that uh, the, Amer the, the Americans, in fact, we have over a million soldiers by the, in, in Europe, uh, most of them not ready to fight, but they're there. Over a million soldiers, it's a lot. And, and just the fact that they're coming, you get this moment in the summer when the number of Germans captured and killed um, is, vastly, uh, is vastly exceeding. Uh, the, the you know the, the 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 balance between the Americans coming in and what the Germans are losing, um, they're they're going in, in in directions that are disastrous for um, for the Germans because they're the the, the losses are uh, the losses are so high. Um, the other the other uh, problem of that that Pershing has and most of the history focuses on this um, is meshing the American for, forces. He's, he, Wilson wants him to be, politically he wants him to be because he wants to control the settlement at the end of the war, um, and he wants the Americans to be the crucial factor. Uh, they, the, one of the big issues becomes the relations in, uh, with the uh, French and the British. And there Pershing, Pershing's quite a good dip, diplomat, uh, and he also is able to somehow to not uh, alienate the alliance break up the alliance too much, but refuse to amalgamate, ultimately refuse to amalgamate, which I will also add counterfactually uh, was probably, um, was probably a, a mistake. Okay, in terms of the, uh, the, th the, the, se the, the second scene, the legacy, uh, there, are several organ uh, there are several crucial uh, points, again, there are more than I'm gonna list, but I'm just gonna list them. First of all was the problem of organization, especially fragmented divisions. And I, this is the way they're recruited, this is the way they're, they're organized, and it causes huge problems in terms of the cohesion. One of the most crucial things in war is the cohesion of the units that are fighting, and the, uh, the, the way the divisions are put together with and new people coming in and the rest uh, makes, makes for great, um, great problems. Um, the second is logistics. The British and the French can't even the French constantly throw their hands up in the air about the Americans. And in the in the uh, big offensives at uh, Saint Mihiel and later in the uh, Meuse Argonne, um, the back of the rear lines of the American forces are crammed with it's most in the again it's ridiculous to think, but it's still true. Mostly donkey and horse carts, and they're huge traffic jams, and the supplies don't get to the soldiers. So American soldiers literally go over the top with with insufficient uh, ammunition and other kinds of, of, of supplies. Uh, the, and the, 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 one of the legacy here, of course, is that George Marshall is in the middle of all of this, and he, of course, becomes the, the genius to, in terms of American ordnance and supply and logistics in the Second World War. Uh, training is a problem. I don't want to go into the list because I, I don't want to get Gretchen mad at me. Um, so the, 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 and, and the training, hit the, the issue here is fairly fundamentally uh, Pershing's as well, because he wants to train his soldiers for what he calls open war 
go into that in great detail. But in fact, they have to be trained for trench war because that's what they're that's what they're going to face. So the soldiers are kind of between the two, the two kinds of uh, ways of fighting, um, uh, f fighting uh, war. Uh, and then uh, finally, and again, this is my this is my caveat or my one of my points I'm going to argue um, rather heftily, so you can you can come at me on it, um, is that. It, Pershing, Pershing doesn't find a way to, ignore, to avoid the war of attrition. And as I said, I, and I can go through, I'm not going to go through the battles, but I'll go through the battles. The one battle that the Americans do the best in, take the most prisoners, lose the, less, lose the fewest men, make the most decisive advances, is long before all the battles that we celebrate. And it, it, that battle is fought under the one general in the war, except for a Russian general, two, two exceptions, the one general in the war who has figured out what kind of war this is and how this war has to be done, and he's in Australia. And the early American soldiers, or some of the best, are put under Monash's command. Uh, and and, and the, the, the most beautiful offensive that the Western Front has seen for three years, if an offensive in this war can be beautiful, um, but the one that, uh, beautiful in the sense of the, the, the lack of loss of men, and, the, and they're, they're facing German troops who are not yet demoralized. They're facing German troops who are still very well entrenched. And the combination, and I think that the, it's counterfactual, but I think that if Pershing were a different man, he never, in the report, he doesn't say anything. He says, well, the, we, the, we got on with the Australians and the Canadians, but he doesn't say anything about Monash and how much he could have learned from Monash as, as the other as the other allies um, could. Uh, but uh, under, under the, the, in this offensive and then in the later ones, and again the legacy here, uh, a couple of things become very, very apparent. And this is probably shocking to most Americans. The first place is that almost all of their weapons come from the French. Their artillery, their tanks, their airplanes. They're, by the end of the war, but by, by November, some Americans are beginning to get airplanes that they're making themselves and a few tanks, but almost all of them come from the British, or in some cases the French, or, or the, Brit, uh, the French, or in some cases the British, where they're uh, integrated uh, into them. And one of the outcomes here, Marshall's very important in this regard, and this is crucial for the Second World War, because one of the things is we, we see the Second World War is coming earlier, and we gear up our industry, and we, of course, become we, with the Lend-Lease program and the rest, we become the, the, the ballast for the British and the Russians and the Chinese with the Lend-Lease programs. And we can do that because we, the, of the lessons of the First World War. The other lessons, and I'm going to talk about these briefly, not today, but in the article, are patents there. And patent, real life, patent becomes the master, um, one of the masters of tanks. Uh, and Billy Mitchell's there. And Billy Mitchell, he actually organizes the biggest air assault in, in war, in an actual war in the, at the very end of, uh, of the war. And of course, he becomes the prophet <coughs> of air power and the importance of air power. OK, final, 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 um, uh, uh, fi final uh, lap. So uh, there's a whole series of myths and large assumptions we make about the war that, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking on just myself, but uh, other people have done a lot of uh, research. Uh, one is that the US uh, is essential for victory. I would argue that it's important it plays a role, uh, but if the US, if we hadn't come into the war, um, I wouldn't bet against the British uh, holding. And that's, that's probably, you know, we can't, it's a counterfactual, so we can't, uh, we can argue it. Uh, but I, I think there's, uh, there's, you can make a pretty good uh, a case for that. Uh, the second, as I've already mentioned, is Persian's legacy. And we can talk about that, uh, the, the, you know, the great hero, the great stalwart American and all the rest. Um, well, uh, obviously, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of problem with that. And the other, the very important implication of this for all the things that we've been talking about, about the diplomacy and the rest, um, is the, uh, Wilson, the Wilson's position at Versailles. Because he needed Pershing to be the man who won the war. He needed the Americans to be the ones who won the war. And the French and the British don't believe second. And you see this most dramatically when Wilson, in the fall of 1918, when Wilson starts to uh, directly negotiate with uh, Germany and the British and the French, when the British, they didn't consult with his allies, and the British and French jump all over him and say, we've been dying for four years. 
and you're now going to make the peace without us. And of course, that bitter legacy is, uh, it goes over into Versailles and the, uh, the debates in uh, Versailles. And then finally, and this, I want, I, I, I almost said something about this last night, and I think uh, Tony has departed already, so um, I won't get uh, uh, Wilson channeled at me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, think, I think the other thing that, that really struck me last night, and I, it was your comment about Vietnam and, and the two sides of the coin. Wilson has that coin. His, this war for Wilson is first of all containing aggressive German militarism which threatens the, you know, America and Britain and because he sees America now rising and it's going to be the, the, the global hegemon. Uh, and it is, it, it, is, it is about war, it is about using, you know, killing people in order to, and in order to guard against that. And that goes, it seems to me that goes hand in love, glove with his uh, internationalism. And this came up earlier in, in the discussion. Uh, Mexico was invaded. The Siberia was invaded. I mean, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't change that history. So he, and the other part for me, in your comment last night, I, I'm sorry I didn't get your name last night, but, um, but I thought it was a wonderful comment. I don't think Walt Rostow had any idea. If he was a Wilsonian, he didn't know it. Because I don't think Walt Rostow, you know, everything I know about Walt Rostow, uh, he was not inspired by Wilson. He had a whole different agenda that was for a whole different uh, era. At any rate, uh, so I think that the other part of this that comes out of the, the American conduct in the war and the use of the American army is this, the, to give Wilson this negotiating power, which he doesn't have, and so he doesn't have very much, ultimately doesn't have very much latitude. And the latitude that he has, he uses it all to save the UN, or the League of Nations, and of course, that's a, that's a, that's a failure, and that's the, that seems to me that's the ultimate legacy. Are you all right? <laughs> Um, the final speaker today is Michael Nayberg, who's a professor of history in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the United States Army War College. Um, I also Googled you. <laughs> and um, your online footprint is, I think, a sort of a model of, I think, what most of us should hopefully aspire to do. Um, he has a website, a Twitter account. He's experimenting with blogging. <laughs> um, so you can follow all sorts of things. On his website, he admits and here's, uh, that he likes uh, coffee, a good cocktail, and Bruce Springsteen. So at dinner tonight, you might want to pick his brain on one of those things. Um, but I think your web presence points to, I think, in what I think in your work and the way you've talked about things is really an active engagement in educating people about history and the importance of understanding World War One and its legacies and its meaning um, for um, students and sort of the public at large today, which seems to speak directly to this panel. Um, and your most recent book on World War One, if I'm not correct, is um, Dance of the Theories, Europe and the Outbreak of World War One. And um, Michael has written on um, both World War One and World War Two. Uh, an Amazon comment said of this book, this book stunned me. Uh, which I think would be a lovely thing to have someone say about your book. And then they said in, in a positive way, <laughs> just so you know. But I think that that's a lovely thing. If you can stun someone into learning something, that's great. So, Mike. Just making sure that was positive. <laughs> they even said it in little parentheses, in a positive way. <laughs> well, thanks, Gretchen. I am going to a Springsteen concert Tuesday night, so um, more to follow, maybe a blog. I don't know. Um, well, being the last speaker of a conference, I, I have a, a double burden. I have to be a little bit repetitive in two ways. Uh, the first is in thanking the organizers, thanking Tom for the invitation, and thanking uh, everyone for the wonderful hospitality here. Uh, I've never been up to this part of New England before, and it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I also have the additional burden of plodding over some of the same ground that other speakers have plotted over, um, but hopefully I'll have some um, different views or some different ideas to present um, uh, on top of the excellent ideas that we've already heard. So I'm grateful to Diplomatic History and to Tom for the opportunity. Uh, Gretchen was kind enough to mention the Dance of the Furies book, and what, I, what, what my next book project is going to be is to take that same basic methodology and apply it to the United States and look at the United States' approach to war from August 1914 until American intervention in April of 1917. And what, what Furies tried to do was to um, not so much take the decision makers out of it, but to try to contextualize their decision making by looking at society through much wider lenses, through what my Army War College colleagues would say, through opening the aperture. Um, so that's what I would kind of like to do here today with the United States. And I want to talk about um, three distinct legacies um, that I think are coming out of this war when you take this kind of approach or this kind of a, an, an angle towards the war. 
And the first, I think, is American conceptions about war more generally that evolve from 1914 to 1917. Um, Regardless of whatever Woodrow Wilson may have said about keeping Americans neutral in thought and deed, it's pretty clear to me that Americans weren't listening to him. Um, the conceptions that Americans had about this war from the very beginning were anti-German. And I want to read you just two quotations here uh, just to start. Uh, this one comes from Life magazine, as mainstream as it gets. In late August of 1914, an editorial in Life wrote, the English, French, and the Russians, and the Russians are a curious uh, uh, asterisk here, but I'll give you the quotation anyway. The English, French, and Russians are fighting in this war on behalf of the liberties of the world. Germany and Austria are seeking to impose on the world a despotic authority to which it would be ruinous to yield. Very unneutral sentiments. And Newton Baker, then the mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, soon to be Secretary of War, Newton Baker wrote, Americans have a very definite conception of the German theory of life, and we generally disapprove of it. So there are two things that I want to really say here. Only oh, the other part of this that you can do if you, if you want, and I've got some of them on my iPad here, is to take a look at the political cartoons that are appearing in major American newspapers, especially life. They are intensely anti-German. Um, so again, whatever Wilson was saying about neutrality, it's clear very few of his uh, countrymen were listening to him. There are two things that come out of this. The first are American attitudes towards Germany, and I know I have two Germans here in the, uh, the audience here. Hopefully, um, well, you may, even if you are Prussian, here it goes. Um, the blame that Americans put, and it's very clear, and it's very uh, upfront, they do not blame the German people, they blame the German government. And in particular, they blame the Prussians in the German government. And you can see this even before 1914 in American news media coverage of something called the Severn Crisis, which happens in late 1913 in a little German garrison town uh, now in France, a little Alsatian town called Zabern in German and Savern in, in French. And since I don't have very much time, essentially what happens is a 19-year-old lieutenant uh, in the German army does and says a whole bunch of stupid, sophomoric, idiotic things um, in Savern that arouses the ire of the local Alsatian uh, community. Rather than punish him, the German military authority says, no, he's, a, he's an aristocrat, he's an officer, he gets to do what he wants to do, regardless of how offensive it is to just about everybody. Um, it turns into a major political scandal inside Germany. Uh, it results in the only vote of no confidence in the history of the Second Reich, that is the Reichstag votes no confidence in the German government. It leads to a movement for uh, Chancellor Bethmann Holweg to uh, resign, and it actually leads to a moment of real crisis before the Kaiser himself intervenes and comes up with a pretty lousy compromise, but one that, that, that temporarily solves the problem. American news media coverage of the Severn Crisis is quite clear. Their argument is that the Severn Crisis is another example of the way that the German government mistreats its own people, that an autocratic, anti-democratic government is the problem. And some American newspapers say, look, this isn't a problem in Severn, this is a problem in Berlin. That the problem is that the German government is unrepresentative. And when the crisis is over, or more or less over in early 1914, the American news media uh, applauds it by saying that, hey, this is an example of the German people taking their government back. So from the very beginning, um, even before the war, looking at Severn and into the war, the American, the American media, American reactions in general, and this is even true of some of the German-American press, um, argue that the German people are just as much victims of the German government as is anybody else in Europe, as are the Belgians, as are the French, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And again, you can see this come through clearly in Woodrow Wilson's declaration of war, which is explicit about this. We are not making war on the German people. We are making war on the German government. I mean, he says it explicitly. And I guess I want to say, too, that I don't think this is due to propaganda. So when you look at American sources, media sources, and you look at American reactions, very few of them, Life Magazine or any of the uh, major American war correspondents that go to Europe, very few of them repeat the most lurid of the propaganda stories that are popular in Britain. And when they do talk about propaganda, they will say, look, don't believe what you're hearing from the British media. Believe what we actually know because that's bad enough. The propaganda is a distraction. Um, and I can give you some more examples of that if you like. There's some very interesting ones. I think this legacy is still with us. I mean, one thing that I was struck with with George W. Bush's discussions of Iraq leading up to 2003 or Afghanistan, it was the same kind of language. We're making war against a government. We're not making war against a people. Um, as a segue to my second point, I want to talk a little bit about nativism, uh, a theme that has come up a little bit. Um, nativism is used by a lot of uh, staunch nativists as a kind of cudgel. That is, it's a way to say, look, any of these Germans, Irish, Jews that don't support us, it's because they don't have the same American values uh, that we have. Um, and there is a nice incident that happens right when the war begins. I'm going to come back to Newton Baker in Cleveland, where he calls the chief of police into his office, and he says, look, essentially what he says is, I think you should go buy some more nightsticks and hire a few more cops, because those passions that are going on in Eastern Europe 
we're going to have a civil war, the phrase he uses, right here on Cleveland streets, because the people in Cleveland are going to fight for their, their home countries. And the chief of police says, look, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I think you're wrong. These people are now Americans, and they're not a threat. They're going to keep their hatreds away. It won't get violent, and it won't get bad. And Newton Baker essentially tells him, well, look, why don't you, why don't you buy the extra nightsticks anyway, and we'll just kind of see what happens. Um, so I want to segue that to a theme that I know others have picked up on, and that's, that's the assimilation of um, American immigrant groups. And I want to focus very, very quickly on three of them just to make a wider point. And to me, the assimilation argument is an important one. The assimilation facet is an important one because it allows me to talk in a kind of transnational context about this. It allows me to bridge the Atlantic Ocean, in a sense. Um, when the war began, uh, three groups, and I'm, I'm going to borrow Andrew's uh, Tri-Faith America concept here because I think it's a very important one to what's going on. Um, near as I can figure from the research I've done so far, Italian Americans are completely indifferent to the outbreak of the war. Jewish Americans are, for the most part, pro-allied, or at any rate, they are intensely anti-Russian, which I think is maybe a little different. Um, but, but if you hear them talking about who they want to see win the war, it is more likely they'll talk about Austria, and then they'll talk about Germany. Um, and then Irish Americans, who are, of course, anti-English, although there's some, there's some um, complexity in there as well. The point that I want to make here is that the standard historiographic treatment is that these groups become, um, again, cudgeled into or forced into a kind of 100% Americanism uh, dehyphenated agreement with mainstream America. And that's part of it. But it is also true that between 1915 and 1917, the goals of these groups come to match the goals of mainstream America much more closely. The Italian case, uh, Italy declares war and enters the war on the Allied side in the spring of 1915, which actually means that there are Italian Americans who go back to Italy. There are these transatlantic connections. Uh, the Italian Immigrant Aid Society in New York City stops helping people come from Italy to the United States because immigration has stopped, as, as Chris pointed out. Instead, they start using that money to help Italians get back to Italy to fight for the Italian army. So, and again, it brings them in line with a general pro-allied view. Uh, the Jews are, are the most obvious case, or the, the easiest case, I think, to demonstrate. The evidence is, is, is the clearest. Um, except for the Jewish socialists, um, most Jews turn pro-allied both because both Great Britain and France, and France is important here, both come out in favor of Zionism. Um, the French case is a little different than the British, but they do. And the Russian Revolution, when it happens, turns Jews from being anti-Russian to being pro-Russian. Now the United States has to defend this movement of democracy against Tsarist reaction. So what's going on here, I think, uh, again, except for the socialists, who I think are a different case, um, these two groups, Italians and Jews, are moving towards a pro-allied uh, view. The Irish case is, is, is intensely interesting as well. And the big movement here, the big moment, is the Easter Rising. And when the Easter Rising happens in about this time, 1916, there are a lot of allegations, many of them true, that it was Irish Americans who had provided a lot of the money and a lot of the logistics and a lot of the connections. So while there are some Irish Americans who are uh, proud of that, there are a lot more Irish Americans who want to make the statement, look, we're not a threat to you. We're not going to do in Dublin, or in New York, excuse me, what they did in Dublin. You can depend on us. You can count on us. We're Americans first. We're Irish second. We still don't like the English, but we're Americans first. So this is, I guess, by way of saying that, that, that this process of assimilation, I think, is a complicated one, but it's one that we have to um, treat in all of its complexity. It's a really crappy sentence, Mike. Okay, so um, the third thing that I want to talk about is the direct investment of the American people in foreign policy and defense policy that begins after the sinking of the Lusitania. And when I used to serve on textbook committees, um, the first thing I would do is open up to the page in the Lusitania. And if it said that the Lusitania caused America to get involved in World War I, it went on the do not purchase pile. Um, however, the Lusitania is very important for two things. First, it demonstrates to the American people that just by screaming neutrality and staying on this side of the Atlantic Ocean will not guarantee that they won't be involved in this war. To paraphrase Trotsky, they may not be interested in war, but war is certainly interested in them. <laughs> the second thing that it does is open up a discussion that's going to last for two years about the best way to prepare for that war should it come. And this is happening again in a presidential election year that, as all of you know, is an incredibly close election year. So this debate uh, that, that is coming on is not all driven by Woodrow Wilson. So what I want to do, though, is I want to read two things from members of his cabinet to show you how different the, the tone is after the Lusitania. This is Robert Lansing, who replaces William Jennings Bryan as Secretary of State. He wrote this in a, in a memorandum to himself. I have come to the conclusion that the German government is utterly hostile to all nations with democratic institutions because those who compose it see in democracy a menace to absolutism and the defeat of German ambition for world domination.
Everywhere, German agents are plotting and intriguing to accomplish the supreme purpose of their government. Democracy throughout the world is threatened. And the second one I want to read is a letter that Secretary of the Interior Franklin Lane wrote to his son in July 1915. He wrote, this was after Wilson's uh, um, uh, diplomatic negotiations with the Germans in, the, in the, the wake of the Lusitania. He wrote, I've grown tired of the damned goose-stepping officers of the German army who would spit upon the American flag. The United States, he says, has talked Princetonian English to a waterfront bully, which is a great phrase. Then he said that the diplomatic approach had failed, leading Lane to support a change in defense policy. We must all learn, he wrote, that sacrifices will be necessary if we are to have a country. So this opens up this debate about what to do. And um, I disagree a little bit with Andrew. Uh, it, the, the, the notion of a global threat may not be there in Wilsonian rhetoric, but it's there in the wider uh, American uh, vision. And I want to just bring up three quick examples. Uh, my favorite is a 1916 Life magazine cover that shows a map of the United States. The West Coast is now called Japonica. The East Coast is now called New Prussia. And the Southwest is now controlled by Mexico. And every American city has been appropriately renamed. So I think New York City is now Hindenburg, and they've all been renamed. Uh, the second one I wanted to bring up is uh, Floyd Gibbons, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, um, a, a, one of, a celebrity reporter from 1914, uh, 1918, who has, his, um, has a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, Gibbons went to Cedros Island, which is off the west coast of the Baja Peninsula in Mexico, and reported that the Japanese were in negotiations to build a massive naval base off the west coast of Mexico. Um, and then the third example that I wanted to bring up is uh, Pancho Villa's raid. He kidnapped uh, an American woman named Maud Adams, uh, who was living in Mexico, and then at the end of the raid, he either let her go or she escaped, depending on which version. Um, she told the Americans that Pancho Villa bragged the entire time that the money for his expedition had come from Germany, and that there was plenty more where that came from. Um, and the American ambassador to Germany, James Garrard, um, and uh, Robert Lansing were, were, were both fully convinced that Pancho Villa's raid was not a Mexican raid into American territory. It was, in fact, a German raid. Um, this is why the Zimmerman telegram uh, is the dynamite that it is, because it proves that in Germany's, in Germany's own words. But what I really wanted to talk about, and I know I'm, I'm pushing up against time here, is the debate that opens up. So unlike 1898 or even um, maybe 1812, um, where there is a crisis that America has to react to, in this case, there is this two-year process of having this very open debate about what to do about how to prepare the United States Army. The Secretary of War, Lindley Garrison, and his Assistant Secretary of War, Henry Breckinridge, supported something known as the Continental Army Plan, which was designed to es essentially take power away from the National Guard units and put it all in Washington, and essentially take the National Guards down to almost nothing and centralize power in, in D.C. Uh, that plan failed in 1916, and Woodrow Wilson failed to support it. So both Garrison and uh, Breckinridge resigned, Garrison telling uh, Newton Baker privately that he could not stomach presidential pacifism any longer, which is another great phrase. Um, and that actually marked the third resignation uh, from Wilson's senior advisors since, uh, uh, as a result of, of defense policy. William Jennings Bryan resigning over what he saw as too tough a policy, and then Garrison and Breckinridge both resigning for what they saw as too weak a policy. So what it actually does is, is open up in an election year uh, a very serious debate about what the United States ought to be doing to defend itself. And the debates follow along two lines, since I'm running out of time here. Um, one is whether that ought to be done by a fleet or that ought to be done by an army. And of course, Wilson is more willing to put money into the fleet than he is into the army because the fleet doesn't present the same kinds of civil liberties uh, questions that the Continental Army Plan did. And $313 million for ships means an awful lot of jobs in an awful lot of districts. Uh, the second debate is what to do with the United States ground forces, what to do with the Army. Should they be locally based in National Guard units, or should they be centrally based in Washington, as most progressives want them uh, to be? In the end, of course, Wilson didn't want to make that decision. Um, and in the 1916 presidential campaign, neither he nor Charles Evans Hughes really want to talk about war policy at all, in part because they're both trying to walk the very fine line of trying to appeal to the German-American vote, which they think is going to be the, the, the decisive swing vote, while not trying to send any signals to Germany that they don't have to take America uh, seriously. But what this does do is it involves this, this national debate, this national discussion that is going on about the proper way to prepare the nation for involvement in war uh, should it come. So those are the three legacies I wanted to lay out. I think I've probably gone uh, over my 10 minutes. So with that, I want to thank you for your kind attention to the last paper presenter on a beautiful sunny day, and we'll, we'll open it up to discussion. Every <laughs> mind. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so my question is for Mike.
Um, I realize it's a kind of a compressed presentation, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, the way you are viewing public opinion um, and its relationship to what's actually printed in a newspaper yeah. or a, a magazine. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's it's a really hard thing to do, obviously. Um, sorry. I think there's an Andrew. Well, oh. I, I don't want to. Can I just piggyback very? Because I was going to ask the question as well, and it was basically the same kind of question, just very briefly. How? So a lot of that lurid anti-German stuff is really interesting, but how? I was going to ask how representative it was yeah. in public opinion, because neutrality is a vote winner. You know, Wilson wins in 1916 in a very close election. Over, you know, on he kept us out of the war, even though right. he didn't say that. And Hughes also right. basically buys into neutrality. I mean, it's it's right. a very very popular. Yeah, program. yeah, it's it's a really difficult thing. I mean, there are a few quantitative things. I mean, there are things like Literary Digest that actually did kind of reviews of editorial pages, um, and I think I've got actually the the numbers. So this is at the outbreak of the war, but I'm pretty sure I've got it. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so no, a November 1914 survey. Uh, showed 46% of American newspapers expressing pro-Allied sentiments, only 5% expressing pro-German pro sentiments, with the rest either not discussing it or, or talking about some sort of neutrality. I mean, it, it's a really hard thing to do. Um, what I'm trying to do is just go where the preponderance of evidence seems to suggest that, that it should go. Um, that you know, we, we don't have public opinion surveys in quite the same way, and even those, of course, are problematic in the way that, that, that they go. Um, the easiest answer I think I can give you is just the, the qualitative methodology that historians use that makes political scientists so uncomfortable. I mean, I'm you know, going with where I can see what's going on and looking at, um, to the extent that I can, the reception of books when they're published, because there uh, there's a wonderful book published by a Pittsburgh woman, uh, Mary Roberts Reinhardt, who is a mystery writer, crime writer. She's the American Agatha Christie is what she's called. And she goes off to Europe uh, fully neutral, following the Wilsonian Vogue. And she comes back and writes this book in which she says, look, America's war is Britain and France's war. Um, and it's a bestseller. It's a runaway bestseller. Um, uh, you know, if you guys have a better method of tracking that, please let me know. But, but, how, do you, so how, but how do you reconcile? I'm not saying they can't be reconciled, but neutrality is popular. Sympathy for the Allies is popular. Yeah. Right? I mean, sympathy for the Allies doesn't necessarily lead to intervention Correct. or pro-interventionism. So what's the significance there? What's yeah, and you do, even Reinhardt says, look, I, we, it, this is our war, but we shouldn't be fighting it. We should be you know, supporting France and supporting. Well, uh, what happens, of course, is that there's an evolution over time. So the Lusitania is, is a moment here. Um, and then when the Sussex incident happens in spring of 1916, these tensions kind of decline, and Americans kind of go back to neutrality. And then by February 1917, it, it shoots back up, and you start seeing people saying, you know, that th this is no longer a, a place for neutrality. This is a place for involvement. Um, it's it's the you know it's the single biggest problem I think many historians face. I mean, can you believe what you're what people are telling you, you know, from a century ago? It's the best answer I think I can give you, unless someone's got a better one. Any other questions? Let's combine them. Yeah. I think just, this is just a little um, clarification question for for Michael Harris actually, and maybe Mike. Nyberg, you can help me out here. Um, well, first, first of all, actually, just like a, just a point of, of um, comment that um, the person standing behind Calvin Coolidge who signs the Immigration Restriction Act in 1924 is Pershing. Yeah. If you look at the picture, uh, so uh, so there will be two mentions of Pershing in this special issue. Right? <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure that it's true, actually, that the first troops sent over to France are the best trained. Um, I thought, in fact, actually, they kept a lot of the best trained in the US to do more training of new recruits, and that they actually send a lot of raw recruits to France, the ones that Pershing calls sturdy rookies. Yeah, no, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean the first ones that go over. I meant the first ones that go into combat under, un, in La Mal are, are some of the best troops. And they perform, they perform marvelously because the, Monash is, Monash, he really does understand the war and the, the American commanders who are co cooperating with him uh, convey that to their troops as he knows what he's doing. They get into trouble later. There's, a, there's another place that they cooperate with the Australians and uh, Monash overestimates because he's had such great success and overestimates how well they're going to do. But the, that, and that, but that, but the first battle is that first moment is really crucial because of the morale effect, particularly on the front. And later, when the, the the last of the German offensives again, Ludendorff has no strategic. He's like Hitler; he has no strategic sense, and so he can't eliminate the British. So he starts ha attacking the French, and the Americans are crucial there too. I think actually the, that that part of bolstering the American lines are much more important than the 
the offensives, which were enormously costly, and um, I mean, you can argue they had some impact on the, the, the outcome of the war, but they were, you know, they were not they were not as important as those early as the, as the early actions. But you're, you know, you're right. A lot. Of the, one of the problems that you couldn't go into all this. One of the problems is a lot of the troops go over very poorly trained. And part of the problem, again, is ordnance. They just don't, they don't have enough guns. American soldiers are training with wooden guns and mortars that are made out of, of metal tubes that aren't mortars at all. And, they, and there's, a, there's a Langer, William Langer, histori a fellow historian. He writes his little memoir. Um, the gas brigade that he, or whatever he was in, um, they, had, they, had no, they had no actual experience. They had no gas to use until they got, until they got to Europe. So, and, uh, and, and and again, the, the, you can't. You have to be careful with this because uh, per Pershing. It's just it's a colossal task to, to create a, an army. I mean, it, we're talking about ultimately four, four million soldiers we were envisioned if the war had gone on. And and the other thing that's really important is that all of the Allies assume that the war is going to go on into 1918. That the war is going to be decided in 1918. Uh, the Germans just come fall apart sooner than. Um, than anyone thought they could, partly because of what, again, what we were talking about, partly what, because of what's happening at home. Yeah, Akira. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do find this question of American images of Germany very, very interesting because I mean, Wilson, after all, went to study in Germany, right? And in terms of high culture, education, mm -hmm. and so on, music, I mean, I think German influence in America. Life was really predominant. Yeah. I mean, Jessica Gino's book on German music in the United States really shows that when Americans wanted to hear classical music, they invited German conductors and even orchestra players to play. So there is an image of high culture of Germany as the center of civilization, so yeah. to speak. There is, um, there is an image, it's, it, it's, it's used in France, it's even used in Germany, of what they call the two Germanies. And yeah. so the, you know, the, there is this image that all of that goodness that came out of Germany is now being under the Prussian heel, and it's being put under this autocracy. So you, you see this imagery come out, if we could just get rid of the Prussian autocracy, then that Germany, that good Germany, can come back out and express itself. And it's interesting to me linguistically that the, the French do it too, that they'll use the terms Allemagne and Prusse very differently, mm -hmm. and the Americans do the same with Germany and Prussia. Um, so it, it's not that all the images are negative, but it is the idea that since 1870, that good Germany can no longer express positive energy. Klaus? Yeah. yeah, I'm referring to your presentation, Michael. Uh, we addressed the American, the American image of the German, of Germany in the war and the setting against each other of the German leader, a pressure, and the German people. Now, I kept a lot of thought of, about that because that carries on all the way to the armistice, the more or less veiled demand uh, uh, for the Kaiser to uh, resign, to step back, and all that. So it's an important element of, American, of the American view, but also of the American policy. It's a sort of, but I think it transcends the particular situation of World War I, but it's a much more general template, pattern of America of viewing the respective enemy. Now, for instance, uh, see Huerta, uh, that guy in, in Mexico, you know, this dictator. Now, again, you have this more or less criminal politician, but the poor Mexicans. And uh, you have it, in a way, again, with Lenin and the poor Russians who suffer uh, later on in 1918. So my, I think I've thought about for a couple of years is what are the origins? I, for instance, I do not know how it was in the Civil War. Uh, was there a separation of the leadership of the South and the rebels, the rebel uh, <laughs> folks down there? There was two. So what are the origins, what are the sources of this kind of um, perspective? Well, I, I, mean, I, I can't speak to it too much generally. I mean, I can speak to First World War, but I think it does have something to do with what Andrew was talking about with a particularly moral tenor of American foreign relations. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, 
I think in this specific German case, um, you know, there are there are people making the German argument. There's a Harvard professor, Hugo Munsterberg, who is yeah, pretty yeah. eloquent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even he, however, says, "Look, uh, the Americans don't want to listen to me." Like, and, and the, the German ambassador says after the war uh, that all the money they put into propaganda was wasted because the Americans didn't want to hear it. Um, yeah. You know, oh, but there was a big propaganda drive among the German intellectuals to say, no, this is yeah. not two Germanies, we are one. And I, you know, I'm not a Civil War specialist, but I, I think part of the reason for, Andrew, or for Abraham Lincoln picking Andrew Johnson as his 1864 running mate was to make the point that, you know, Andrew Johnson was, was, represented yeoman farmers in, in the Upper South, was to make the point that we're not here to destroy the South, we're here to liberate it. We're here to get the plantocracy off of your backs. So maybe it does. The, the interesting and, thing about that too is it, it goes on today. Think of sure, the Iraq of War. We demonized Syria. Iraq. Bush said over and over again, "This is not a war against the Iraqi people, even though we bombed yeah, sure. Iraq back into the Stone Age. It was all about Saddam Hussein." Yeah. So I think part, it strikes me that, at least looking at the, the the current, is that we want to believe we're a benevolent nation, so that we would never unleash all this fury on a civilian population when we do. Uh, so that we, we, but we focus in, in doing that, we have to get rid of this evil leader. Uh, it's despite the fact he's a secularist, but we have to get rid of this evil leader, and so we, we want to obfuscate the fact that in order to do that, we basically destroyed Iran's inf infrastructure. It's a way of disarming the enemy, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. by getting rid of its leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, two perhaps naive questions, one for Michael, one for Julia. Um, uh, Michael, you painted 1917 totally reasonably as a bleak year for uh, Britain and France. Um, so I was just discussing on a panel at the International Studies Association. It was a pretty good paper by uh, actually a Princeton and a Rutgers, two graduate students wrote this paper together in political science um, about the German peace overtures at the end of 17 and um, their haughty dismissal uh, uh, by the British and sort of the failure to take these up. Um, so you were suggesting that um, it's the, the, maybe it's the morale effect of the U.S. that, that you know, kind of what, what would be your explanation? That one natural explanation for this is the British wouldn't take it up because they thought the U.S. were bailing them out, mm -hmm. right? And um, maybe you could blame that on morale, but that would suggest a lot of U.S. agency in the victory, maybe more than I think you were giving in your talk, right? So you can talk about that. And then, Julia, uh, um, I gathered your book title was focused on the Red Cross and you're focused on humanitarianism. Um, uh, uh, it seems to me there's a legacy of humanitarianism in the war, which is um, the success of the kind of engineering approach, and Hoover gets a lot of um, uh, positive reputation from this, and I was a little surprised um, that you didn't talk about that, that legacy of World War I humanitarianism when you're talking about legacies of that. You talk about more controversies where the humanitarianism is a good idea, and I wonder if you could riff on that for a minute. Sure. Yeah, I can speak to that. And I think the, the larger essay does, you know, a bit more. I mean, one of the things, thinking about this war is really the first time that, that American aid is, is consciously sort of professionalized. I mean, it becomes much more of a man's game. Uh, you know, the, the Red Cross hires um, American sort of businessmen to, to be its wartime director and to sort of make aid. You know, to, they, they tell them to run it like a big business, you know, to, to bring sort of corporate principles to the Red Cross. So that's part of it is the corporate principles. Engineering, you know, Hoover uh, sort of bringing, you know, his, his sort of engineering mind to first the Commission for Relief in Belgium, later the American Relief Administration. Um, but during the war itself, Hoover comes back to the U.S. and becomes the American Food Administrator. Um, and it's in 1917-18, when the U.S. is involved, the American Red Cross is actually taking up many of those same efforts. But yes, very much pursuing the same sort of engineering-minded. And I think it's it's a it's a very progressive, you know, approach to to relief. It is you know we need to calculate everything. We need to have you know all the numbers, all the statistics. We need to um, you know be able to sort of quantify relief. And you really, really sort of see this this effort to to quantify it and to to you know, make make relief not just about relief either, but also about something more constructive. So uh, I mentioned sort of nation building activities. Um, they're not just giving food and shelter. 
They start public health campaigns. They build nursing schools in various uh, cities and countries throughout Europe. They build orphanages and, and, and fresh air camps, sort of exporting, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of exporting settlement house, uh, you know, everything that settlement houses have to offer to, to the war front. Um, so those sorts of aspects of, of social engineering as well as, you know, the, the engineering mind are definitely coming in. The, it's, it, it's, a, it's enormously complex, and part of it is, um, for the British, is they, because of the way the, Russian, the uh, Germans have behaved towards the Russians, the, the British don't want to, the war to end with the Germans with the upper hand, because they're afraid they're going to have a draconian, they're going to have a draconian piece on their side. And the, the high command, Lloyd George especially, politically they're very, very concerned. The British have taken huge, huge, I mean, they're not used to that. They, that's the other thing about this, is that the British purposely don't fight, you know, put large armies on the continent, because that they, they'd rather pay other people to die for them, but they've been dying. And the politically, in that, in that, at that moment, I think the, you're right. The Americans, the fact that the Americans are coming is important. But the other thing is that in the short term, the British know that the Germans are coming first, because because it's very clear that they're transferring the million men from the Russian front and they're they're preparing an offensive. And the Germans have figured out some things like how to you do an artillery barrage before you attack, and the rest. they've learned a lot from fighting the in the in the east. Um, and so that the, the, I think the, the really crucial factor is that the, it's just untenable for them politically and also the, the military. Haig also, ever the optimist, Haig thinks he's finally got it figured out anyway. And, and so the, 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 issue, the issue then becomes, um, and, and the, other, the other part, and this is probably very true, they, they have a really good sense of what's going on in Germany and the high, they know that Ludendorff now is Ludendorff, Hindenburg, Go, sort of goes where Ludendorff goes. Ludendorff is calling the shots, and they know that Ludendorff, and the, the Navy now. Well, the thing is that what's happened is Bethmann Holweg has been isolated, and so that the, and that the Tsar now, or uh, the Kaiser now has uh, the ear of, of uh, Ludendorff and, and the, uh, the Admiralty, the, the, the German Admiralty, and they're all telling them, you're all telling them this can work. Uh, we, can, we can win, and the British know that. And they, I think it really is, I, your, your point, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard in this situation, it's the same with the propaganda. It's hard to judge where the tipping point is, but I think at, at that stage, it's le the Americans are, are less important at that, at that point, I would argue, but, uh, but I, I would certainly, you know, be open to counter, counter uh, arguments in that score. Andy? Sure. Yeah, just a couple of things. On the ideology, uh, how you portray the enemy kind of question, it seems to me that it's a little bit more functionalist than you may be suggesting, which is, if you look by analogy with World War II, I mean, the Italians, Mussolini's the problem, the Italian people are innocent dupes. The Germans, however, are militaristic to the core, and we have to not just fight Hitler, we have to deal with the German people, we have to deal with the Japanese people are militaristic to the core, we have to, so how that government people issue gets posed, I think is contingent to a substantial degree on how they want to pose the war aims. Now, so that's one observation. Secondly, on the naval power question that, that, that Michael raised, um, I think one of the, it's, it's really striking, under Secretary of State for the Navy's FDR during this whole, <coughs> during this whole period, and what, Roosevelt, what Franklin Roosevelt gets from his naval experience in World War I, is, is really, really important to shaping American strategy in, in World War II. And the naval base of American strategy, which is often overlooked, and naval power often just kind of is not really viewed as being, uh, what I've studied in the Mediterranean, the, Ameri the, the vision of American navalism is critical to the whole projection of American power. Now finally, maybe the question that can kind of bring us back to the starting point. Um, seems to me Wilson's problem, in, uh, 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 in, uh, at Versailles was precisely what Michael was addressing, which was there simply were not Amer enough American troops effective enough in Europe to give the United States the leverage it needed at the, at the conference to win the kind of peace that the United States is, 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 is seeking, and therefore the failure of a... So, I mean, I think the question of the... The bigger question, I guess, is that the military issue 
despite Pershing arguing, let's go on to Berlin. I mean, let's not forget that about, you know, that was... I didn't, I couldn't uh, go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the actual, yes, the Americans play a very important role in the, the military solution to the war, but it ends before American military power on the ground in Europe is at such a point that the Americans are going to be able to impose a diplomatic solution. Yeah, one, one of the things I cleaved off because of time uh, was the was the uh, the naval the importance of this this and the, and then, I mean that goes back to Mahan in, in, in profound ways. But the war just the, the war and the the effect of the destroyers and the rest in that in that crucial stage that crucial moment of the war uh, abso absolutely see, see, because if we're beginning to conceive ourselves as a global power in the fullest sense. And we and the war helps us to understand. Mahan was right. You, you really can't do that at that point in history, at any rate. You can't do that without uh, naval superiority. So. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, as we're coming to the end of the conference, uh, one thought has been in my mind all day in terms of legacy is in August of 1941, Churchill and Roosevelt met at Bargentia and drew up the Atlantic Charter. How many of the themes that you've all expressed today are in that Atlantic Charter? Mm -hmm. The United Nations, mm -hmm. self And that, did that, was that drawn from all this experience here that they had? That's a very good point. It, it's not just that the themes are there, but the contradictions and the, I, I hate, maybe hypocrisy is not quite the right word. I mean, they do the Atlantic Charter, and then Roosevelt makes it quite clear, this does not apply to the Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Monroe mm -hmm. Doctrine is exempt. You know, so I mean, it's 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 Wilsonianism on its positive sure, and its and negative, and and it is exempt. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, you know, it was a so off. I mean, you know, and I just happen to know this from other work that I've done. When they get to the Potsdam conference, I mean, Truman comes in talking about these grand principles, and Stalin just starts knocking them down one by one. He just says, "Look, your Atlantic Charter is ridiculous. It's hypocrisy." And if you no, no, but but when 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 the Americans and British start talking about principles about about which to to organize the world, Stalin just. Don't, don't talk to me about that. Your, your principles are hypocritical. So uh, I guess that's by way of saying, I mean, I, I see both positive and negative reflections when they get to the Atlantic Charter. I mean, it's, it's the same basic problem. It's, it's, it's Ares' problem. It's how to take the rhetoric of what you're talking about and actually make it happen. And what happens when you clearly don't? But do they draw that, was that charter drawn from their experience? Oh, and the, the shadow of Wilson is over everybody. I mean, it's over, it's over Roosevelt. I mean, he talks about it all the time, about fulfilling this vision. Uh, Truman, when he takes the oath of office, he does it under a portrait of Woodrow Wilson on purpose. You know, I mean, they don't want to do it exactly the same way. And, you know, what's different at the end of World War II, I, I think, is that they, they figured out that if, if soldiers are your only instrument of national power, you lose that the second the fighting stops. So by the time you get to 1945, there's the Bretton Woods Agreement. There's, you know, there's all of there's the International Monetary Fund. I mean, there's all of these things that have been created that are instruments of American power that are non-military, and they do it on purpose. John Maynard Keynes has come up a lot. I mean, Keynes figured it out in 1945. He knew what the Americans were doing. And they also be sure they're, they're sure to start earlier this time, so right. they don't yeah. wait until the right. war is ever until the very last moment. It's you know yeah. starting even before the U.S. enters. It, it's there when they get to Potsdam. The Americans right. can just say, "Here it is. This is this is what we're doing." The domestic issue of the GI Bill saying, we've got the veterans, what are we going to do with the veterans when the war is over? You know, one of the most interesting echoes of Wilson is over Richard Nixon. Gary Wills has a great article about Nixon. He comes into, into power. He has a portrait of Woodrow Wilson uh, in the Oval Office. He uses Woodrow Wilson's desk, and he sees his, in role, his role in bringing peace in Vietnam as a kind of Wilson, <laughs> Wilsonian. I'm not kidding. This is, this is serious. <laughs> I mean, for him, it's serious. It's not a joke. And he's a Quaker. He mixes right. <laughs> Final question? No? You guys good? Um, thank you so much to the panelists for being here, and thank you, everyone.